Could you describe what happened this morning and the phone call and how you felt once you were informed? So um, uh, I came back from Germany yesterday. I was actually getting another award in, in Frankfurt. Um, I, my plane didn't get back until 8 o'clock last night, so I was pretty exhausted. I came home, kissed Nancy goodnight, went to bed at 9 o'clock, and uh, fortunately was able to sleep for four and a half hours before the phone rang. The phone rang at 1.30 this morning. Uh, I was dead asleep. Uh, I heard sort of a vague noise. I heard Nancy yell out, this is it, this is it. <laughs> I jumped up. Uh, uh, my heart was pounding. I went to the phone. It rang one more time. I picked up the phone. I was trembling. Uh, but then a comforting voice with a thick Swedish accent answered on the other line to congratulate me. It was Goran Hansen, the chair of the Nobel Committee. I happen to know him because I served on another committee with him a few years ago. He assured me this was not a prank call, that it was the real thing, and he told me what I could expect for the next hour and a half before they issued a press release. He said, uh, don't call anyone, don't tell anyone. I said, can I call my family? He said, yes, but they can't tell anyone. I then hung up and uh, kissed Nancy and then went immediately to call my dad. My father lives in Southern California, 86 years old. He's been waiting for this moment for years, telling me every year that he, um, time was wasting, he wasn't going to live forever, and I better hurry up. <laughs> so I was thrilled to be able to call him first with the news. He was, of course, shaken, taken aback. He and his wife, my, my mother died uh, some years ago, unfortunately. She would have, one, it would have been wonderful to have her here for that moment. But uh, he and his wife were thrilled and um, will join us in Stockholm in December. I then called my children. They were incredulous. I called my best friend, uh, Bill Wickner, from, um, from Stanford, and uh, my high school friend, Peter Wisner. And uh, then by the time the press release came out from Stockholm, I was inundated with you folks. Uh, I did manage to have a time to brush my teeth and shave and take a shower. But, um, but other than that, I'm now at your mercy. But what was your feeling? Now my feeling, my feeling. Work, work for a long okay, so yeah, so um, 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 uh, when you win uh, awards, as I've had the good fortune to do, people are const constantly remind you of, of this day. So even in the, the event that I just enjoyed in, in Frankfurt, um, the person who introduced me said, uh, how many times winners of this award go on to win a Nobel Prize? And he said, and we'll see what happens on Monday and all throughout this meeting, you know, what's going to happen on Monday. Um, I have to put that out of my mind, and so I wasn't really, I didn't think it would happen. When it happened this morning, having lived through the moment that it could happen, you have all these thoughts about clever things that you're going to say, and all I could say because I was so shaken was, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> and then I went speechless. I couldn't say anything more. So, um, but Goran Hansen was very gracious, and uh, I look forward to speaking with him as the days go on. There are a lot of people watching our material who aren't scientists. Sure. How could you explain to the everyday person sure. why this is important to them or a family member? Sure. So uh, all the cells in our body, or almost all the cells in our body, manufacture protein molecules. These are the little machines that do all the, all the things that make life unique. They allow cells to be nourished, to grow and divide. Um, and uh, all cells from bacteria to man, devote uh, some considerable fraction of their energy to producing proteins that are shipped outside of the cell. Most of the proteins work inside the cell, surrounded by a biological membrane, but some have to be encapsulated vesicles and delivered to the perimeter of the cell where they pop or fuse at the cell surface and discharge their internal content to the cell exterior. And the molecules that you all know about that enjoy this pathway or follow this pathway are molecules like insulin, growth factor, viruses exploit this pathway, our immune system depends on this pathway, uh, and the pathway has been, was understood at a kind of a superficial level by uh, classical biologists who looked inside of the cell and saw a myriad of compartments, membranes, that communicate with one another by a pathway called secretion. So secretion is the, is the key word. Um, when I started in 1976, one knew really nothing about the nuts and bolts of how secretion is executed. What are the cellular machines 
that encapsulate other proteins, uh, march them through the cytoplasm of the cell, and push them out through the cell surface. Um, the classical techniques to study this process were not up to the task to identify the precise molecular machines. And so uh, what, what I decided to do, which was different, which, which was to... Was It's not intuitive, but when you cripple the process by a specific mutation, you gain a lot of information about the nature of the gene and of the protein uh, that executes that step. And within a few years of our having done this, through the efforts of this brilliant student, Peter Novick, uh, we, the techniques of cloning became available, and we cloned uh, the, these yeast genes, and then others in other laboratories uh, found in sequencing genomes, like the human genome, that, uh, that uh, these very genes that we had discovered in yeast were found in the human genome and uh, did the same thing. And so if you look in all of our cells, you'll see the, the same genes and proteins that we discovered in yeast working just as they do in yeast to execute things like communication between nerve cells or the production and, and secretion of antibody molecules, production and secretion of insulin. Um, and uh, as a result of making that connection, it became really pretty obvious to the emerging biotechnology industry that one could use yeast and the power of fermentation, of very large-scale fermentation, to commercial quantities of, of these otherwise very precious protein molecules. So in the history of diabetes, for 50 years, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, principally Eli Lilly, had to rely on pig pancreas from the slaughterhouse to purify insulin for the use in treating diabetics. Now, that's pig insulin. It's not the, exactly the same as human insulin, and some diabetics can't tolerate pig insulin. So uh, the dream was to have the human gene. There was a race to clone the human gene for insulin. Genentech and UCSF and Harvard scientists fought among each other to, for that prize. And Genentech was the first to harness that and produce useful quantities of, uh, of, of, of insulin. So, um, uh, uh, but then the realization that you could actually do this all in yeast made a huge difference, and the biotech industry has exploited this. Now that's, the in, that's the industry. That's not been my goal. My goal, once again, has been to focus on basic science and to continue to try to understand things at ever higher levels of resolution, and I'm, I'm convinced through those old studies and by our more recent studies, that that will once again have application in, in the pharmaceutical industry and in the clinic. So right, it's... question from the, the, the telephone. Sure. Uh, is there a, a reporter on the line who'd like to ask a question? 